Alright guys, welcome back to another video. So in this one, we're going to be finally solving a problem that I've had in the shop for a while now, and that is having a place to store my hardware. Uh, I love all the little bits of hardware and that that you get to work with as a woodworker, you know, all your nice hinges and screws and all that. But the problem is, my hardware is spread out through about four or five different places in the shop, and every time I go looking for something, I can never find it. So, with the little bit of limited budget that I'm on right now, I figured that doing some small projects like this would be just about perfect. So, the other part with this project is, for the longest time now, I've wanted to do an apothecary cabinet. And the thing that stresses me out the most about doing an apothecary cabinet is just the sheer number of drawers involved. So I figured with this smaller project that only has seven drawers, this would give me a good idea as to whether or not I actually want to do an apothecary cabinet in the future. Beginning here, this is another kind of way that I was trying to figure out how to make the design of this thing different, is I wanted to make these two frames that were created using box joints and then connect those together to make kind of the frame of the, the case here. Uh, the terminology here is going to be very confusing because I don't quite know, it's not really a cabinet, it's not really a box, it's, it's just a lot of case work I guess you could say. So the idea here is just purely that I want that box joint joinery in the corners and this is the best way I could figure out how to do it. Now, you might not like the, uh, this idea of it, but I'm doing the glue up on the table saw because this is going to give me the flattest surface possible. The flattest surface of my shop is my table saw, my workbench. I've tried to get it flat, it just doesn't want to go. So the table saw is a great place to work for getting these perfectly flat glue ups. And I'm making sure to take the time to square up each of these frames. And I'm using my tape measure at a diagonal here because this is the most accurate way to make sure that something is actually squared up. Putting a little square in the corner is usually not going to work, and I'm just going to go through and adjust the clamps inwards or outwards to, until it's sitting right at the perfect angle there. With the frames out of the clamps, I can go through and start to flatten them up. Now my first idea was to put them through the drum sander, and this, this is a good way to make sure that they're a fairly even thickness all the way around. The one problem with my drum sander in specific here is that because it's an open end one, it has a tendency for that head to move up and down. So I was getting these little divots uh, right past the uh, right before and after the end pieces. So then I went through with my little hand plane here and just touched it up. Now this is always the thing that I find funny in woodworking is that this is a $40 hand plane that I picked up, you know, it's over you know, 50 years old, and it's correcting the errors caused by a $2,000 machine. So that's always one of those things, but that's also the really important part of using hand tools is that you can go through and correct any of those minor errors. Now this is another important part, I'm using the table saw to clean up the, the protruding box joints because I want to make sure that these frames are now perfectly square and perfectly sized up to each other. So what this means is that the thickness of all of our pieces is just slightly different from each other, but our, uh, the outside edges are all perfectly square and lined up. So it's, it's kind of a complicated thing to understand, but it makes more sense when you actually do something like that. Then we're adding a groove around the inside because we're going to be adding some mortises later. I realized quite literally right after doing this that this was a really bad idea and that I should have used the router to make a stop groove instead. Now the reason I didn't use the router is just because I couldn't figure out how to get the right kind of accuracy. The router table that I have is not great, it's, you know, it's a fairly cheap one. Uh, plus I wanted to make sure that this groove fit the size of my mortise chisel. Now if I thought about this in reverse and I'd cut my mortises first and then cut my groove, it actually would have been super easy because then I could have very quickly dropped the, the workpiece over the router with the router bit pointing into the mortise and then cut my groove just like normal without any kind of anything punching through. Now the important lesson from this is to kind of think about a project from a 3D perspective. So for as long as I've been woodworking, or as long as I've been using mortise and tenon joinery at least, my process has always been I'll cut a groove so that way I can easily line up my mortise chisel, then I'll cut my mortises, then I'll cut my tenons to fit. But in the case of this project, it would have made much more sense to cut my mortises first, then to cut my groove, because that would have just allowed me to get a little bit of a cleaner result. So it's just a matter of thinking about the project as a whole, and it's really important that on every project you do, you take the time to consider the best way of doing things, not just the way that you've always done it. Because that's exactly the trap I fell for here, is I just cut my mortises the same way I've always done them, uh, which is not always going to be the best way. Sometimes when you change up your process, it can give you better results, just again, depending on whatever project you're doing. And these corner pieces are the perfect example of order of operations, because we've got three distinct bits of joinery on it. We've got the bevel, the tenon, and the groove, and depending on which order we cut them in can actually make the process safer or more dangerous. If we were to cut the bevel first, Cutting our groove later on would be a lot more challenging because we have no way of gripping it and pushing it through the blade. And same thing with the tenon, it'd be much harder to align that. So order of operations is always something that is very, very important to consider in a project. 
for all the panels, this is where I decided to splurge. Now, walnut is a crazy expensive wood, and I really hate the fact that I don't get to work with it as much as I would love to. Walnut is, like, I think like most woodworkers, walnut is one of my favorite woods, and it's just such a shame. But for this project, I figured that I've got this one piece that is just kind of the perfect size in my shop. I don't really have a good use for it because one side has a lot of sapwood on it, so I don't really have a good project for it. And plus, I don't really have enough walnut in my shop to really use on a project anyway. So by splitting this piece in half, we now get all four of the panels that I need for this thing. Top, bottom, sides, it's, it's worked out quite well actually. And it just means that I get to use this beautiful walnut. The other nice part about this is this, uh, this hardware chest, I think we can call it that, that we're making, actually is going to blend really nicely with the toolbox that I made for myself, which is also cherry and walnut. So I think that I'm kind of starting to build up a theme for some of my shop furniture you know I'm not getting too dedicated into building a ton of shop furniture at the moment just because I don't really have a permanent setup in the shop here I've, I'm looking to upgrade you know in, you know a little while here uh, so I don't really want to build anything too intense but these you know the small toolbox and this little hardware chest are just a really great way to start putting some things together and just bringing some classiness to the shop because there's really nothing better than being a woodworker in your shop and having some nice woodworking surrounding you you know not everything Thing needs to be you know these industrial metal cabinets or you know slap together plywood chests uh, you can have some really nice woodworking in your shop and I think that as a woodworker it's very good to have some of that stuff around you to just kind of create that inspiration I can definitely say since building that toolbox for myself and just the fact that I get to store all of my hand tools in that and I'm using it on a day-to-day -day basis that thing has just brought so much joy to me. For such a simple project, it has been such an enjoyable thing to use, and I'm hoping it's the same thing with this chest of drawers for all of my hardware. So we're just going through and getting everything cleaned up here, and this is one of the most awkward angles I've ever had to use my hand plane at, so I'm just cleaning up those inside edges because they were protruding just slightly. So I'm using my rabbiting block plane and just trying to knock them down and not clean up the glue squeeze out as well as those little bit of protruding material. Now this may seem counterintuitive, but the way I'm going through and filling the holes here is just with some walnut dust and a little bit of type on three. Now I'm doing this to highlight these holes so that in the future this serves as a reminder to make these grooves the proper way, not the way I did here. So moving on to the drawers now, this is where the sheer scale and the number of pieces that had to go into these drawers started to kind of get crazy. Uh, so you can see this big chunk of eight quarter stock that I'm cutting into right now. This is not all of the pieces for the drawers. This is about two thirds of the pieces needed. Now that's not too bad, you know, because we're, we're actually actually getting a lot of pieces out of these individual ones, but there is still a heck of a lot of pieces involved when you're dealing with drawers. Drawers are a very time intensive thing to make, but it's also well worth it because they do, they are probably the best method of storage. But anyway, for these drawers, I wanted to take some design inspiration from the nightstand that I just made and go through on each of these drawers, put a good trimming of uh, walnut on both the top and bottom edge. Because when I did this on the nightstand, I just found that it looks so good because the walnut trim basically adds a shadow line. And I just think that this looks amazing. And I want to, I don't want to do this on every project because it's definitely a detail that you could overdo. But I think combining that with the box joints just looks so, so good. Plus, with the case of this project here, because we're going to have all these drawers directly beside each other, having these bits of walnut trim around the bottom and top edges just creates some separation as well as some blending between the drawers. So we do get a little bit of both of those completely opposite words in there. Uh, but yeah, you can see here that the glue up is pretty simple. So we're taking our eight quarter blanks, just gluing in those strips of walnut in between. Uh, and the idea here is that we just want as good of a glue connection as we possibly can without gluing everything together. I was very terrified that after I did this glue up that everything was going to be in like a solid form and I was gonna have to split things apart on the bandsaw. But I got pretty lucky, no glue got in between the walnut pieces and everything just kind of broke apart pretty easily when I took it out of the clamps. Now it's really important to mention when if you're gonna do a glue up like this, make sure you have a lot of clamping pressure. Because those walnut strips are so thin, you do need a ton of clamping pressure evenly distributed along the length of them. So just go crazy with clamps, put a bunch on there. Once you take those pieces out of the clamps, then it's time to start going through and just cleaning them up and getting them ready to be broken down into our individual drawer pieces. So we're starting on the jointer, and you can see I'm jointing one of the edges here, and I'm barely taking off any material. I'm just taking off just enough to square things off, and it's very important to remember which side you're taking that material off of. Then on the bandsaw, we can break this down into 5 8 thick pieces that will then be milled into half-inch thick pieces later on. Now this is the single most efficient way to make half-inch thick drawers I've found. Taking that eight quarter piece of stock, breaking it down into three pieces, gives you perfect yield every single time for your half inch drawers. 
Now, this is, like I said before, very important to remember which side you hit on the jointer because now we need to go through and remove an even amount of material from the opposite side so that both of our walnut strips stay at the exact same width. Now, this is a very challenging thing to do, but with a little bit of patience and some light taps on your table saw fans, you should be able to dial it in pretty much perfectly. Now, the best part about the way I designed this chest of drawers is that all of the drawer pieces are the exact same because my drawers are completely square. So this made the whole production part of this very, very easy and that made it a lot more enjoyable because I didn't have to worry about mixing up my pieces or trying to get the best grain into certain spots. I just made a whole bunch of pieces and then went through all of my pieces, found the seven best looking ones and made those my drawer fronts. Then, because we're going to be using box joints on here, it's very important when you're dealing with this number of pieces in that to keep everything as organized as possible. So what you saw me doing there with the green tape was just marking the top edge of the drawer. So when you're cutting box joints, you always want to keep one edge facing the exact same way, at least that's how it is with this lead shape. Uh, so you always, as long as you always align the bottom edge of whatever piece you're doing to that bottom edge of the jig, everything is gonna come out just about perfectly. You're gonna get pretty much perfectly aligned joints. And that's one of my favorite things about this method of cutting box joints. Now this is quite literally the single most expensive method of cutting box joints, but in my opinion, it's well worth it. If you're, if you're someone that wants to do a lot of dovetails on large scales, or you wanna do a lot of box joints, this Lee Jig is one of the best tools you can possibly get. That's not a sponsored bit, I promise. It's just one of my, it's just my personal opinion on it. I've been trying for years to cut box joints and the Lee Jig has just proven to be one of the most useful tools. Then we can go through and add in our grooves to all of our drawer bottoms. So for my drawer bottoms, I'm just gonna be using some simple uh, Home Depot hardboard. Uh, it's a very simple, very cheap and affordable material that is not, you know, not super fancy, but it gets the job done. So I can fit that into the groove and it just makes life a little bit easier. So right now we're doing just a quick dry assemble, putting all the drawers together, making sure that all the components actually fit. Now this is really important before you do a glue up with box joints, you wanna dry assemble the pieces because sometimes there can be like a little burr or something that you end up knocking off when you dry assemble it. And you don't want that to be in your way when you're doing the glue up. Then for the glue up, I'm actually going against what I've said a lot of times in the past, but I'm using hide glue because I used this again on the nightstand project and I found that using hide glue on box joints works so well. I can't stress this enough. The, the pieces slide together beautifully and it's actually super strong, a lot stronger than I ever would have thought. So I was, I've been very impressed by hide glue recently and it's definitely going to become kind of my primary glue that I want to use from now on for any joinery method. And again, it's very important when you're gluing up your drawer boxes to make sure that they are coming out as square as absolutely possible. If they come out a little bit out of square, it's not that big of a deal, but you want them to be as square as possible. Then when it comes to cleaning up those protruding box joint bits, uh, it's, this is one of the areas where I highly recommend using a belt sand or something like that. Now you can use a hand plane, but what I found through the hand plane that I tried to do, because that's what I, most of the times that's what I've tried to use in the past, uh, is that the hand plane will break out the fibers very easily and you'll end up with this very rough bit. Whereas if you use the belt sander and knock those protruding pins all the way down to be flat with the rest of the drawer, then you go through with your hand plane and clean things up. That'll give you a very good result. But if you just go at those protruding pins with the hand plane, you're gonna end up with a bit of a rougher result. So it's kind of blending the best of both worlds, both the traditional hand tools as well as the modern machinery. But then of course, just like usual, all of my drawers have to be fitted up with the hand plane. Now, when I say that this was one of the most painful things I've ever done, there's no joke there. Uh, I love fitting drawers with a hand plane because it lets you get this very, very precise, beautiful fit. Uh, but it can be kind of painful, especially for someone like me. I don't do a ton of hand tool work, so I don't really have the calluses and that in my hands and, and my body is not really developed in a way that makes hand tool work easy. So the day after doing all of these drawers, I felt like I got hit by a freight train. I was sore all the way from my abs to my arms. Everything was a little bit of pain. And one of the things that I found very interesting while doing this is the comfort level between different styles of planes. So for years now, I've been using my Veritas Low Angle Jack, and that's been my go-to plane for everything because that was the first plane I ever bought. But recently, I've bought a whole bunch of antique Stanleys, and I've been kind of using those more often because I do find them a little bit more enjoyable to use. So when I was doing these drawers, I was kind of bouncing back and forth between my Stanley number no. 5 and my Veritas Low Angle Jack. And I definitely found that the Veritas Low Angle Jack, it did... It worked a little bit cleaner, the blade had a little bit less chatter, overall it was a little bit better of a plane to use, 
and because it was wider, it got the job done a bit faster. But my number five was definitely a lot more comfortable to hold. It definitely, it fits, the tote fits your hand a lot better. The knob is a little bit better shaped for my hands. So I just found it very interesting how this, you know, the antique planes do have, still have some of their benefits versus the more modern planes. Now, again, it might just be because the low angle jack is shaped the way it is. You know, I'm not bashing the tool. I just find it very interesting that there's different comfort levels for those handles and that. It's just not something I ever really thought of. But it's one of those things I'm definitely looking forward to taking advantage of in the future here. So now we're at the point where we need to mount in our drawer slides and this brings us back to that topic of order of operations because the trick is here is there's a lot of different ways you could do this. Some are going to be really good, some are going to go be really bad, uh, and some are going to make your life a lot easier. So why I say it's very important is because typically when you make drawers, especially drawers like this that are going to be kind of floating around each other very close to interacting with each other, it's very important to have a small gap in there. But right now, all of my drawers fit very tightly into the space. You can see that this top drawer, I have to kind of wiggle it in to get it fitted in place. We don't want the drawers to be this tight when this thing is done. I'm doing this specifically so that I can use the drawers to then align my drawer slides. And this will give me every, just about perfect alignment of those drawer slides on every single level. So again, when I say order of operations is important, if I'd gone through and I'd gotten all of my drawers sized up and to make sure that there was a nice even gap between them or a nice even sizing so that there would be an even gap between them, we wouldn't be able to go through and use this method. We'd have to use like a specific spacer piece or a size piece uh, to then screw in all of the different drawer slides. So it's again, it's all about trying to just think about the project from as many different angles as you possibly can and see if you can figure out a way that is going to not only be easier, but also gonna work really well to give you good results. So with all of the drawer slides here, I'm just going through and fitting them individually to each drawer so they are an absolutely perfect fit. From there, we can cut them to size and then put in our screw holes, countersink them so that the screws are sitting nice and flush. And it's very important too, when you're putting in the screws here, you want to countersink them just a little bit extra so that that screw is well below the surface. That way, if you ever have to go through and hand plane these slides just to create a little bit more space, you have the option to do that and you're not going to run your hand plane or your block plane into a, the top of a screw head. That would be a very bad thing to do. So I can very safely say that this method worked beautifully. Uh, not all the drawer slides went in perfectly square, perfectly straight, anything like that, but they also didn't need to because they were perfectly referenced to the drawers. So when the drawer slides in and out, it follows the path that it wants to follow. I don't know if that makes sense, but it worked out really well for me is what I'm trying to say. So if you're trying to build something like this for yourself, uh, this method actually worked surprisingly well. So I've never actually made drawers and slides in this method before where this is just basically got the, the drawer slide that goes part way through the drawer box. And I found it very interesting because I was kind of shocked about how smooth it was even just with this raw wood on raw wood. Uh, so when we actually go through and put some finish on and then we go through and buff it on some uh, paraffin wax, that made the drawers so much smoother and they actually move in and out very, very easily. So at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that I'm interested in doing an apothecary cabinet. And I have to say that after doing these drawers, I'm still kind of torn because the problem with an apothecary cabinet is there's a lot of work involved in making those drawers nice that is not really seen. It's they're, they're a very interesting piece of furniture that takes a ton of work, but a lot of that work goes unappreciated. So I don't plan to do an apothecary cabinet anytime soon, but it's also not a project that I'm going to completely cross off the list. Because the one thing that this project did teach me is that drawers aren't actually as hard as I always think that they are. They do take a little bit of work to get them cleaned up and fit up and all that kind of stuff, but if you follow a few simple steps and you kind of do stuff in batches, it does make it a little bit easier. The one final and probably most important thing to mention with this hardware chest that I'm building here is you're going to notice later on as we put the, do the final assembly that there's no organization in the drawers. I just left them open for now and that's because I want to figure out how I'm going to use this thing. Uh, right now, like I said before, I've got a ton of hardware all over the shop and I don't really know what I have or what needs to be stored in this thing. So I want to leave it for a few months and then eventually I'll get around and I'll make some more organization in that for the inside once I have a better idea of what I want to keep in this thing. But for now, I figured it was better to just kind of keep it open so that I could uh, figure out how best to store stuff in there. Because again, I really have no idea how much hardware I have floating around the shop and it's better to get it all together, use this thing for a few months and then kind of go through and put the effort into making some nice organization for the inside. 
So the final challenging bit for this project was trying to decide what kind of drawer pulls I wanted to use. I had all kinds of different ideas of something kind of built into the top edge, uh, making wooden drawer pulls or using the brass ones that you're gonna see me use here in a minute. But I finally decided on the brass ones because I've, I've kind of come to this realization that I'm not a fan of wooden drawer pulls. I've tried to, I tried to make them on the lathe and I just couldn't make them even enough that they looked good. They all kind of had, they all looked a little bit too unique. And for this project, I just didn't really suit it. Everything on this is very uniform, you know, with the box joints and all that, and it just didn't look great. So I'm gonna keep practicing at making those wooden knobs and eventually I will use them on a project. I just wanna wait till I have a little bit more skill there because for some reason I've, I do much prefer the look of the brass hardware uh, and I will probably be sticking with that for the next little while, but I definitely eventually wanna to get to the point where I can do some wooden knobs. So as we near the end of the video here, I just want to thank you guys for making it this far in. I really appreciate the time it takes you guys to watch these videos, and I always love hearing your comments and your thoughts about the project in the comment section down below. And if you guys feel like I've earned it, feel free to hit that like button because that really does help this video and the channel just grow in general. So as always, guys, I do hope you enjoyed this one, and I will see you in the next one.